by weight and by wingspan. It is the largest aircraft in the world, an innovative and highly advanced prototype that's capable of performing missions no other aircraft can. Its name is the ROC, brainchild of Strata Launch Systems, and suffice it to say, it's among the most incredible beasts that humanity has ever put in the sky. And in today's episode of Mega Projects, we're going to explore the ROC in all of its glory, how it was made, what it does, and how it's paving the way for a new aerial revolution. Today's episode is brought to you by our longtime friends over at Squarespace. Whether you're starting a blog, launching a business, or teaching an online course, Squarespace absolutely have you covered. Imagine this, you're an aspiring entrepreneur, you're ready to dive into the online world, and what's your next move? Well, you've got to get a website sorted, don't you? Don't go onto Google, don't do any of that. Don't, don't be like, oh, what should I use? Do I need to learn how to code? No, 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 just go to Squarespace and you'll be fine. They've got something called Fluid Engine, which is a next generation drag and drop system. You choose a template, Fluid Engine is there, you swap things out, you put a picture in, you put your own text in. You're good to go. Magic wand for a website. Plus, they have a couple of other things I'd like to tell you about courses. So if you've got some genius knowledge in your mind, what you can do, go onto Squarespace, make your website, make a course, you upload the video, you make a paywall, and you're good to go. Sell your course, make some money. Plus, Squarespace extensions allow you to get a whole lot of extra functionality in your website. So when you're ready to get started, go to squarespace.com slash megaprojects, you get a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the code megaprojects and you'll save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring, and now back to today's episode. The Strata Launch Rock was born amidst a wave of optimism in one of the 2010's most defining waves of tech, commercial spaceflight. In the months and years that the Rock was first conceived, SpaceX was launching its Falcon 1 rocket and its Dragon space capsule and birthing the latter with the International Space Station, while Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic, and other billionaire-funded space ventures were capturing public imagination and raising the standard for what private space travel might one day become. The Rock was the pet project of one such billionaire mega-investor, Paul Allen an now-deceased entrepreneur who had co-founded Microsoft alongside childhood friend Bill Gates. By this time, Allen had already made a name for himself in commercial spaceflight. His prior venture, Spaceship One, had put a suborbital commercial spacecraft into space at an altitude of above 350,000 feet or 110 kilometers. Spaceship One had been a triumph of early 2000s space engineering and a pioneer craft for the wave of spacecraft design that was going on when the rock was in its earliest days. But Allen's next major contribution to the field of commercial spaceflight wouldn't be in the form of a spacecraft. It would be in the form of an orbital launch system. What he envisioned was a massive aircraft, one on the scale that it could carry an entire space-worthy rocket on our gargantuan external hardpoint, ferry that rocket to altitudes similar to where commercial airliners fly, and launch the rocket from altitude into space. That sort of launch system would answer a wide range of challenges that the commercial industry was facing at the time. After all, companies wouldn't need to secure launch pads or build their own. They could launch their rockets, no matter the weather, by simply flying above cloud cover before launch. Further, they could operate anywhere around the world that happened to be close to an airstrip that could support such a massive plane. The organization that would build it was Strata Launch Systems. Created solely to support the design and construction of the rock, Strata Launch was based out of the Mojave Air and Space Port in Southern California. They built a specially designed hangar to construct their new beast, and they announced the concept to the world in December of 2011. The project called for an airplane that was unlike anything that had ever been built before. Due to the incredible payloads it was supposed to carry, it was all but impossible to design a single fuselage aircraft that could carry its payload under a wing without causing it to fall out of the sky. And it would have been unthinkable to place a rocket on a plane's underbelly, given its size, unless you could build its landing gear onto stilts and then somehow make them functional. Instead, the aircraft would need to employ a twin fuselage design, with each fuselage big enough that they could stay stable in flight while an entire orbit-ready rocket, fully loaded, hung on a pylon in the center. The two-fuselage design was nothing new in itself. World War II saw several heavy fighter prototypes, and even the successful piston-powered F-82 twin Mustang in America's arsenal, which became the last American piston-engine fighter aircraft ever to be produced by the US. But an aircraft of the size Strata Launch would need was another matter entirely, one that had only ever been explored in concept art prior to the rock's creation. The closest thing that the world had at the time was the scaled composites White Knight II, a four-jet, twin-fuselage plane that had first 
first flown in 2008. It was an aircraft that Allen and his team were intimately familiar with. After all, it was the direct successor craft to the one that had brought Spaceship One up to altitude. But Y-92 was still just barely a third of the size that Stratolaunch was thinking about. So, with what limited insight Stratolaunch had available to them, they set forth into unexplored territory. They named their beast The Rock, after a legendary bird of prey referenced in Arabian folklore said to be so mighty that it could seize fully grown elephants in its talons. And all things considered, that comparison wasn't too far off. The construction process would take years upon years and millions of dollars. With the glaring sun of the Mojave Desert, over 300 people at a time pitched in to work towards its completion. Buoyed by the intense optimism of the era and the very deep pockets of its benefactors, the rock was able to proceed easier than most contemporary planes, and certainly easier than most of the similarly innovative projects that have happened over the past few decades. With no expense spared on its creation, and with all parties seemingly sure that the advent of a full commercial spaceflight industry would make the rock indispensable, the plane sped along toward completion at a rapid pace. Sure, there were naysayers, no shortage of people willing to claim that the rock was being built for an industry that didn't yet exist. And sure, there had been plenty of drama at Strata Launch's highest levels, with plenty of partners and investors pulling up stakes as the project went on. Perhaps worst of all, SpaceX ultimately declined to provide the intended launch vehicle, and the next company to supply a rocket, Orbital ATK, eventually decided that they wouldn't participate either. But in the end, those little hiccups wouldn't prevent something quite as gargantuan as the rock from taking to the skies. When we consider The Rock in all its glory, there is no other place to start than its sheer, incredible size. Boasting a tip-to-tail length of 238 feet, or 73 meters, it's longer than any commercial jet aircraft in the world, just barely beating out the Airbus A380 by a couple of inches. At its highest point, the plane's twin tails rise a total of 50 feet above the ground, that's 50 meters, and its wingspan, its crowning claim to fame, is the greatest of any airplane in history, 385 feet, or 117 meters so wide that if it were parked on an American football field, its wingtips would hang 15 feet past the goalposts on either side. That's nearly 20 meters wider than the next runner-up, the famed Hughes H4 Spruce Goose of the 1940s. And in terms of its lift capacity, the rock is no less astonishing in its scale. Sitting empty, the rock weighs in at 500,000 pounds, that's about 227,000 kilograms, or 250 tons. But even that earth-shaking weight is somehow less than its external payload capacity, where it can carry an additional 550 thousand pounds or 250 thousand kilograms add its fuel load and the rock hits a maximum takeoff weight of 650 tons almost 600 thousand kilograms or 1.3 million pounds it's powered by a total of six pratt and whitney pw4056 turbofan engines the same ones that work in teams of four to power the boeing 747. with those engines it can haul its considerable mass at speeds as high as 530 miles an hour that's 850 kilometers per hour over a range of 1,200 miles or nearly 2,000 kilometers before circling back and coming home to base. With the payload attached, the rock can hit a service ceiling of 35,000 feet, well above any weather that could pose an obstacle to a rocket launch. The plane's twin fuselages are of unique design, quite clearly created for the rock itself instead of being grafted together from pre-existing aircraft parts. They're boxy, except at the front end, a design choice that's possible because most of each fuselage is completely unpressurized. The left fuselage is unmanned, though it does have a cockpit for use if needed, and it's got room for 2,500 pounds of equipment, depending on mission demands. On the right side, the plane is flown by a crew of three, a pilot, a co-pilot, and a flight engineer. Both cockpits are a direct copy and paste of a Boeing 747 aircraft craft, separated from the rest of the unpressurized fuselages by heavy bulkheads. Between the fuselages, the main center wing is supported by four exceptionally strong main spars and four secondary spars, fixed with so-called mating and integration systems, or MIS, that allow the plane's many potential payloads to dock with it. The wings are each built with a full 14 trailing edge flaps, enabling it to break if need be, and on the underbelly, each of the two fuselages comes equipped with 12 main landing gear wheels and two nose wheels for a grand total of 28. The plane must have a runway of at least 12,000 feet to achieve liftoff, enough to make it fly up a range of airports around the world. Suffice it to say, the Strata Launch Rock was a highly impressive achievement of aerospace design, and when it rolled out of its hangar for the first time on the 31st of May 2017, it cast a long, long shadow over the Mojave around it. With hundreds of millions of dollars already spent, the rock was tested extensively on the ground to ensure that nothing was likely to go wrong in flight, and by the end of 2017, it was trundling across the runway. 
Through 2018, it completed faster and faster taxis on the runway, to the point that in January of 2019, its nose landing gear lifted off the ground for the first time. By April of that year, the rock was ready to take to the sky. The Rock's maiden flight took place on April the 13th, 2019. It was a day of remembrance as much as a day of celebration. Strata launch founder Paul Allen had died in October of 2018 of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. He'd never see the beast take to the sky. And that wasn't the only bad news for Strata Launch. A few months after Allen's death, the company announced it would no longer build its own rockets, further cutting down on the list of spacecraft that The Rock could attempt to carry towards space. But on the day of first takeoff, nothing was going to stand in The Rock's way. Over the course of a flight spanning just under two and a half hours, the aircraft would fly to an altitude of 17,000 feet, that's 5,200 meters, and hit a top speed of 190 miles per hour, or 306 kilometers an hour. The flight would feature maneuvers from roll doublets to pushovers to pull-ups in what test pilots that Evan Thomas described as, quote, exactly what do you want the first flight to be. And for the most part, the airplane flew as predicted, which is again exactly what we want. It was a very smooth flight, and the team had a lot of fun. By the time the plane touched down again, a crowd had gathered at the airport, and to thunderous applause, the rock found its way safely back to Earth. Said the CEO of Strata Launch, quoting, It was an emotional moment for me to personally watch this majestic bird take flight, and to see Paul Allen's dream come to life in front of my very eyes. But even as The Rock proved that it as an aircraft was a resounding success, the future of Strata Launch itself was in doubt. With Paul Allen now deceased, the company's main source of funding was gone, and just barely a month after The Rock's first flight, the news came out. As of the 31st of May 2019, Strata Launch was shutting down. It would attempt to sell The Rock at an asking price of $400 million, for which you'd also get the company's facilities, designs, and well, that sort of thing. But when in June 2019 news emerged that billionaire Richard Branson's offer for The Rock had been all of one single dollar, it seemed as if the plane was doomed to never fly again. It had been a bold endeavor. It had taken a flight that honored the legacy of its creator, and that might be where it ended. Well, that was until October the 11th of that same year, when Strata Launch announced that it had been acquired and was about to get back into business. The firm responsible was Cerberus Capital Management, a firm worth about $60 billion that's very good at acquiring and turning around failing or collapsed companies. Strata Launch, on the brink with barely a dozen employees left, was able to start hiring again in order to turn itself around, and The Rock, just inches from an untimely demise, was now back in business. But from the outset of The Rock's second chance comeback, it was clear to all involved that some rethinking would be necessary in order to make some use out of their plane. The commercial spaceflight industry was no longer the stuff of wide-eyed fascination, but now a mix of slow, incremental progress and loud, embarrassing failures. The companies who still had any hope at launching their rockets into space didn't really need the rock. They'd long since developed alternative means to conduct their liftoffs, and nobody else was coming along to shake up the industry in a way that the rock would help with. But simply, there would be no need for a fleet of rock aircraft powering the next generation of space travel because, as it turned out, that next generation was still a long way off. The Strata launch did still have a really, really big plane. And that was a tool that could be used for a range of new and innovative purposes. Now, it's at this point that we'd like to introduce a new character into our story, Talon A. It's a much, much smaller vehicle than the Rock, just 28 feet, and that's 8.5 meters long, 11.5 feet, 3.5 meters wide, and it's not heavy either. It weighs in at just 6,000 pounds, or 2,700 kilograms, 3 tons. Smooth, sleek, with a stubby little tail and no room for occupants, it's a fairly unremarkable little guy, except for the fact that it can fly at over five times the speed of sound. Talon A is a hypersonic testbed flight vehicle, one that Strata Launch had first proposed in late 2018 and really started working on in early 2020. By this time, the world's fascination with hypersonic aircraft was at roughly the same fever pitch as it is now, and Strata Launch was going to be working inside that market with the intent to eventually develop hypersonic vehicles that could be fully reusable, carry cargo, or even bring passengers into space. Those later craft, the Talon Z and the Black Ice, are still very much on the drawing board, but the Talon A has since become a reality, and it's The Rock's job to launch it. By April of 2021, The Rock was flying again, with four total flights under its belt by February 2022. By then, it had flown for several hours at a time, come close to airline cruising altitude, and proven that it could travel, if not fast, then a bit quicker than the lumbering pace of its inaugural flight. But it was the flight The Rock took on May 13, 2023, that really mattered. On that day, The Rock got to haul cargo to altitude for the very first time, carrying a prototype version of the Talon high above the Pacific Ocean and letting it go. This particular Talon was a 
glide aircraft, one without fuel on board, but with that flight finally triumphantly complete, the rocket proved that it could do exactly what it was intended to do. Next time the plane flew, it would carry a truly functional Talon A loaded up with fuel and ready to go hypersonic. For the prototype's part, the Talon Zero glider was able to perform its own maneuvers before smashing into the California Sea, completing its mission as intended. As of now, the ROC has carried the Talon A into the air several times, including its first time in December of 2023, when the Talon A was fueled up and hypothetically ready to launch. Yet again, everything went as planned, meaning that a hypersonic flight by the Talon A is likely right on the horizon. With the ROC able to carry three of the Talon A's at once, and the Talon A itself believed to cost just a fraction of what the US Department of Defense's own hypersonic aircraft demand per flight, it's more likely than not that the ROC will be kept busy for months, if not years to come. And as the ROC proves itself again and again as a competent lift vehicle for the toughest of tasks, it's more than likely that new jobs will start coming its way as the world begins to realize just how unique an aircraft it's got on its hands.